Chapter 16 of Land of the Burnt Thigh by Edith Eudora Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Matthew McNaughton. Chapter 16 Fallowed Land. So it happened that only a few weeks before proving up time, Ida Marie and I had to start all over again. But with the coming of water into that thirsty land, it didn't seem so difficult to begin again, and we weren't doing it alone. It was the settlers who built a new shack, a new building for a printing press, the settlers who clothed us during those first destitute days. This is cooperation, they laughed at our protests. The wand has always preached cooperation. In the cool of the evening I rode out over the devastated prairie, past the charred timbers and ashes of my claim, across the scorched and stunted fields blighted by drought, avoiding the great cracks which had opened in the dry earth and lay gaping like thirsty mouths for rain. The crops were burnt, and the land which had seemed so fertile looked bleak and sterile. I rode through the reservation gate, there was no one at home at Huey Dunn's, but his little field of shocked grain lay there in the midst of burnt grass and unharvested fields. Instead of dry chaff, there were hard, fairly well-filled heads. It had withstood the drought sufficiently to mature. In an average year, it would have yielded a good crop. On his claim near the reservation, a young man was doing quite a bit of experimenting. He was a graduate of an agricultural school. I looked at his fields, which also had come through the drought much better than others. From other farmers scattered here and there who had tried the following plan, I got records of methods and results. Then I rode back slowly, thinking of what might be done for the Brule country. Drinking water supply could be obtained. The next most vital problem was moisture for the crops. Most of the rainfall came in the growing season, but in dry years it was inadequate and much of it wasted on packed ground. To produce crops in the arid or semi-arid regions, out-of-season moisture, heavy snows and rains, must be conserved. There must be a way to harness it. Next to lack of moisture was the short growing season. These were the principal barriers to converting the new west into an agricultural domain, the latter problem could be solved, the farmer said. Progress already was being made in developing seed adapted to the climate. The Indians had produced quick-maturing corn through their years of corn raising in a small way. There could be developed a hardier, short-stalked grain eating up less moisture, agricultural authorities maintained. The farmers said that nature itself gradually would do a great deal toward that end. Experience, science, time. Of course, this was a land of the future, not of today. The homesteaders had expected to tame it in a year or two, when many years must be spent on even the smallest scientific discoveries. They had demanded miracles. That was because they had no resources with which to await results. President Roosevelt had done much in turning public attention toward the necessity of reclaiming these public lands, and already much was being done. They had been too long neglected. Years ago, when the supply of government land had seemed inexhaustible, the tide of settlers had swept around the forgotten frontier, on beyond the arid and semi-arid land, to the fertile soil and the gold fields on the Pacific coast. But the time had come when this neglected prairie was the only land left for a land-hungry people. Some way had to be found to make the great arid plains productive. The Department of Agriculture was turning its attention to the frontier, establishing bureaus and experiment stations in various western states, making scientific research. At the request of the WAND, two agricultural agents from the state experimental farm came to examine the soil and advise us as to its possibilities, as to crops and cultivation. They reported it rich in natural resources with splendid subsoil we would have to depend greatly upon the subsoil and its moisture-retaining quality. And over the frontier there was talk about a new system of conserving moisture. Some said it was bound to sweep the West. The method was called fallowing, the method Huey Dunn had used. It was a radical departure from anything farmers of the rain belts had ever used. 
The few sodbreakers who had tried it thought they had found a way to conserve the moisture and at the same time to preserve the land. But it was not they who heralded the plan as a great new discovery. To them it was a way to raise their own crops. They may have learned it in the old country where intensive farming was carried on, or, like Huey Dunn, figured it out for themselves. But it was ahead of the times in the New West and generally looked upon as an impractical idea spread largely by land agents as propaganda. Many of the farmers had never heard of it. What I had heard and read of following now came back to mind. I was in a position to keep better posted on such things than they. I got out my letters and records and spread them before Ida Marie on the old square table, and with the sweat dripping down our faces from the heat of the lamp we eagerly devoured their contents. Huey Dunn's plan of mellowing or rotting the soil was not yet the true following method. But it will mean cropping the land only every other year and plowing and raking the empty soil, Ida Marie said in a tone of misgiving. The topsoil is kept loosened so that every bit of moisture will be absorbed into the subsoil. Suppose it does mean letting the land lie idle every other year, alternating the fields, I contended. There is plenty of cheap land here. It will be a way to utilize waste space. Farmers in other arid regions, I learned as I scanned the letters, were raising forage crops on the land in the off-year. But it will take two years, Ida Marie reminded me. The settlers had no money to wait so long for a crop. And all that labor, she went on. It may be the solution, but I doubt if the settlers would listen to any such plan. I knew she was right. Two years of waiting, labor, and expense. Labor was no small item with the poor homesteaders. If the government would put in money to carry out this new system until the farmers could get returns from it, it is a gigantic project for the government to finance. It would require great financial corporations to develop this country, Albert Donovan had said. I talked it over with some of the more experienced farmers on the Strip who understood the processes required. They figured they could plant part of the ground while the other lay following. If it happened to be a wet year, that would give them something to go on. But mine got how we gonna pull through next winter, old man Husband raved. Even Chris had no answer. In the years of experimenting, the following system underwent a number of changes, but we had the plan in its fundamentals. After each rain, the land should be loosened, and late in the fall, it should be plowed rather deeply to soak up the winter snows. The topsoil must be kept from packing. It was worth trying, they agreed, if they could get money to pull through this drought and stay on the land. This might be a solution for the future, but for the people on the land the solution must be immediate. Empty purses could not wait two seasons for a good crop, empty stomachs could not await the future, and famine stared the homesteaders on the lower brule in the face. Our proof sheet came out with the message, We can fallow. There was encouragement to be derived from it, of course, but it was hope deferred. Then, sitting in the doorway of the shack, leaning against the jam for support, my pencil held in tender fingers not yet healed, I wrote to Halbert Donovan, setting forth the possibilities of the Strip and the West under a moisture-retaining method of farming. It was a morning in late August when I turned to see a well-dressed man standing in the open door, Halbert Donovan. At the first meeting he had found the West green and bright with spring colors and the outlaw printer of the McClure Press excited and voluble over the possibilities of the country. Now the investment broker found a land of desolation and ruin and the printer in sorry plight living in a crude bare shack clad like some waif of the streets in the clothes donated by the settlers. But he had come. He had driven out from Pierre along the dusty roads through the sultry heat in a long, shiny automobile. On the sagging couch leaning against the hot wall, he sat wiping the perspiration from his face as I told him more of the following idea. He had not heard of it. He knew practically nothing about agriculture. But he was a man to whom any method of developing vast resources would appeal. At first, he said little crinkles breaking around his eyes, relieving the sternness of his face. I read the wand, 
how I did laugh at the name you gave it, with refreshing amusement out of a personal curiosity you had aroused. I wanted to see how long you would hold out. Later I became deeply interested in this Western activity. I knew in what mood he must have reached the shack after that drive from Pierre across parched earth, seeing the ruined crops, passing settlers' homes which from the outside looked like the miserable huts one sees along waterfronts or in mean outskirts of a city where the flotsam of humanity live, and cluttered around them farm machinery, wash tubs, and all the other junk that could be left outdoors with countless barrels for hauling water and the inevitable pile of tin cans. It was dreary, it was unrelievedly ugly. Above all, it looked like grim failure. Earnestly, I faced him. We aren't done, I told him. We've just begun. Badly, I know, but we can fallow, make reservoirs, put down artesian wells. I completely forgot, in putting these possibilities of the strip before him, to mention the gas and oil deposits which we had discovered during our frantic search for water. I did not think of saying, We have natural gas here. Let's go and look at the Ben Smith Ranch with all its buildings piped with gas. And over on the Carter Place, a drill came up from a shallow hole sticky with oil. But the minds of the settlers were so focused elsewhere that little had been said about these things. With an investment broker interested in mining projects under my very roof, many of us might have become rich and the brulee prosperous in no time. Development of agriculture, to my mind, was of broader importance than oil strikes anyhow. Men do put money into undeveloped things, I said. Eastern capitalists risk millions in undeveloped mines and oil fields in the West. This is different. Land is solid. He answered thoughtfully, As an investment, land is not so precarious as mines, but there are no big profits to be reaped from it. That's the difference, my girl. He must have known that even for investors, western land was going to be a big thing. He must have known that the railroad companies were buying it up, that the Milwaukee had gone into a spree of land buying in Lyman County. I poured him some water from the can we kept in a hole in the ground back of the shack for coolness. He took a swallow and set it down. Good Lord, how can anyone drink that? he exclaimed. We get used to it, I told him, and we'll have a better water supply in time. It will rain. It's bound to rain, sooner or later. He looked out at the blazing sky, the baked earth, a snake slithering from the path back into the dry grass which rustled as it moved. So this is the land you want to save, he exclaimed. The incredible thing is that people have managed to stay on it at all. They will stay, I assured him. Remember that these builders have had nothing to work with, no direction, no system, or leadership. What would businessmen accomplish in such an undertaking under the circumstances, if they had experienced leaders, men like you? In other words, he smiled, laying up riches where moth and rust do corrupt. He walked to the door and stood, hands in pockets, looking out over the plains. Then he turned to face me. My dear girl, I might not be worth a hoot at the job. Oh, you would, you would, and if the settlers never repaid you, think what a land king you would become, I laughed. No, I don't want the land that way. I want to see the settlers succeed try to keep them from being squeezed out. He mopped his face, picked up the glass of water, and after a glance at it, set it down untouched. Now I've been thinking of this Western development for some time. It's going to open up new business in almost every field. Aside from all that, it is worthwhile. I've kept track of you and your brulee. If one gets his money back here, it is all he can expect. How much would be needed to help these settlers hold on? A little grub stake, some future operating money. I like this following idea. He talked about second mortgages, collateral on personal property, appointment of local agents, etc. He did not want the source of this borrowing power to become known as yet. It was he who brought me back to my personal predicament when, ready to leave, he expressed his desire to help me, asking if I would accept a check for you and your sister to carry on. 
But I refused. I had appealed to him for the country, not for myself. But his offer mortified me, made me conscious of my shabby appearance, the coarse, ill-fitting clothes, the effects of the fire still visible in rough and smoke-stained skin, the splotches of new skin on my lips, the face pink and tender. Altogether the surroundings and I must have made a drab spectacle. Holding out his hand to say goodbye, Halbert Donovan saw my shrinking embarrassment. Suddenly he put his arm around my shoulders, drew me to him, brushed back the singed hair, and pressed his lips to my forehead, turned my small blackened hand palm upward, looking at it. I'll help you all I can, he said. Just keep your utopian dreams. So it happened that, before famine could touch these people who had already struggled through drought and blizzard and despair, they found help in sight. Halbert Donovan put up $50,000 as a start to be dealt out for emergency on land, livestock, etc. Heretofore, loans had been made on land only. Now the reliability of the borrower himself was often taken into account as collateral. It was enough that we knew the borrower was honest, that he was doing his best to conquer the land and to make it yield. We gambled on futures then, as we had done before that it was eastern capital handled through a system of exchange and agencies was all that those who borrowed knew or cared. And each day we scanned the heavens for signs of rain. We searched for a cloud like a starving man for bread. The settlers went stalking about with necks craned, heads thrown back, eyes fixed on the sky. And the cartoonist from Milwaukee took to looking for a cloud with a field glass. A cloud no bigger than a man's hand would raise the hopes of the whole reservation, but in vain we searched the metallic blue of the sky. With spectacular ceremonial and regalia, the Indians staged their rain dance. The missionaries had long opposed this form of expression by the Indians, and their objections led to a government ban which was finally modified to permit some sort of ritual. These symbolic dances were not mere ceremonials for the Plains Indians. They were their one means of expressing their emotions en masse, rhythmically, of maintaining their sense of tribal unity. The first part of the ceremony was secret and lasted for several days. After that, the public ceremony began. Painted according to ritual, they danced in a line from east to west and back again, whistling as they danced, every gesture having its symbolic meaning. The whistle symbolized to them the call of the thunderbird. Pioneers belong to the past, people are prone to say. Savage customs belong to the past. But it was in the twentieth century that primitive men, their bodies streaked with black paint, fasted and danced, overcoming an enemy as they danced, compelling the thunderbird to release the rain. And on the strip men and women prayed as fervently to their own god, each in his own way. That night, something breaking the dead stillness woke me. A soft, slow tapping on the roof of the shack like ghostly fingers. It increased in tempo as though birds in this land without trees were pecking at the roof. It grew to a regular drumming sound. I lay for a few moments, listening, wondering. Then I leaped out of bed, ran to the door, and stepped outside. Rain! 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 Ida Marie, I called. Get up, it's raining. She was out of bed in a moment as though someone had shouted fire. In nightdress, bare feet, we ran out on the prairie, reached up our hands to the soft, cool, soothing drops which fell slowly as though hesitating whether to fall or not. And then it poured. The grass was wet beneath our feet. We lifted our heads, opened our lips, and drank in the cool, fresh drops. I lay down on the cool blanket of earth, absorbing its reviving moisture into my body, feeling the rain pattering on my flesh. Over the prairie dim lights flickered through the rain. Men and women rushed out to hail its coming and to put tubs and buckets under the roofs. No drop of this miracle must be wasted. In their joy and relief, some of the homesteaders, unable to sleep, hitched up and drove across the plains to rejoice with their friends. After that eternity of waiting, it rained and rained until the earth all about was green and fresh. Native hay came out green, and late-planted seed burst out of the ground. 
some of the late crops matured. There was water in the dams. The thirsty land drank deep of the healing rains. The air grew fresh and cool. Haggard faces were alight with hope. The lower brule became a different place where once again people planned for the future, unafraid to look ahead. With the mailbag, the salvaged type, and Margaret's few sticks of furniture, which she wrote to us to take, we moved back to the homestead, to the site of Ammons. The settlers had the building up. This time it was a little square-roofed house made of drop siding, no more tar paper. A thin, wall-board partition running halfway to the ceiling divided the small living quarters from the print shop. The McClure press had died the natural death of the proof sheet, and the proof king was submerged in the cause of prohibition. Later he was appointed federal prohibition agent for the state of South Dakota. He gave us most of the McClure press equipment. So I got that hand press after all. What few proofs were yet to be made in that section were thrown to the wand. With the current proof money coming in, we bought the additional supplies necessary to run the paper. I sent a telegram to Halbert Donovan. Rain. Pastures coming out green. Dwarfed grain can make feed in the straw. My flax making part crop. Dams full of water. Fall following begun. In hilarious mood, I signed it, Utopia. Delivered the 25 miles in the middle of the night, special messenger service prepaid came the answer. At a girl, am increasing the stakes. He did. Halbert Donovan's company interested other financial concerns in making loans, to deal out through competent appraisement. So the brule won through, as pioneers before them had done, as other pioneers in other regions were doing, as ragged, poverty-stricken, gallant an army as ever marched to the colors. End of chapter 16「Seventeen of Land of the Burnt Thigh by Edith Eudora Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Matthew McNaughton. Chapter 17. New Trails. Ida Marie and Imbert were going to be married. At last Ida Marie was sure, and there was no need of waiting any longer. So she went back to St. Louis for the first time, and two weeks later the wedding took place. When they returned as bride and groom, the settlers came from every direction, accompanied by all the cow and sheep bells, tin cans, and old horns on the strip for a big chivalry. They came bringing baskets of food for the supper and any little article or ornament they could find at home for a wedding present, singing as they came, Lucky numbers are we, and we won't go home till morning. Imbert took over the Cedar Fork ranch and store that little trade center outside the reservation gate where a disheveled group of land-seekers had faced a new dawn rising upon the strip. And Ida Marie, who so loved the land, came at last to make it her permanent home. Steady, practical, and resourceful, it was such women the West needed. The sturdily built log house was a real home, no tar-paper shack. Rustic, we would call it now, with four rooms and a porch. There were honest-to-goodness beds, carpets, and linoleum on the kitchen floor. Ida Marie was so proud of the linoleum that she wiped it up with skim milk to make it shine. There was a milk cow and, consequently, homemade butter and cottage cheese, all the makeshift discomforts of homesteading replaced by the solid and enduring qualities of home. Peace, home, happiness for Ida Marie. And Ma Wagger's problems were solved, too, it appeared that her first husband had left her more than the antique brooch of which she was so proud. He had left her a son who had grown to be a stalwart, good-looking young man who worked with a construction company out in western Nebraska. Learning of the Wagger's misfortune, he came, started another store at Ammons for his mother, and helped her to run it for a while. All around Ammons the fields lay freshly turned, fallowing for next year's crop. Our field of flax had been cut for what little it would make, and the ground plowed over to soak up the winter's moisture. With the turning of the ground for another season, a page in my own life was turning. What am I going to do, now that I've come in under the wire? I wondered. And then I proved up and got my patent. 
I borrowed a thousand dollars on it to pay off the government and the balance due our financial backers who had gambled on us without security. But I did not borrow the money through the Halbert Donovan Company. The loan had been promised me by the banks many months before. We had borrowed on the first homestead to get the second, borrowed to the limit on the second to pay for the privilege of helping to run the reservation. We now had both farms mortgaged to the hilt. But the hay alone would pay the interest and taxes. Land would increase in value. I was alone at the shack now with the newspaper still to get out. Riding across the plains toward the claim one afternoon, I heard the swift, staccato clicking of type as it fell rapidly in the stick. The metallic sound carried across the prairie as I neared the shop. As I walked in, I saw, perched on the high stool in front of the type case, a little hoydenish figure with flying hair, Myrtle Combs, the hammer and tongs printer. This don't look right to me, she remarked, reading her stick as I came in but a good printer follows copy even if it flies out of the window. Myrtle had come back on vacation to see how her homestead was progressing. Seeing that I needed help, she unrolled a newspaper bundle and hung her extra dress and nightgown on a nail, laid a comb and a toothbrush on the dry goods box dressing table, and for two weeks she, quote, threw out the paper with a bang. About this time the regime of our government was changing. Out of the West, from which we had had only sheep and cattle, there were coming men destined to be leaders in the affairs of the country. As men had risen from the ranks to guide the destinies of the colonies, so men appeared from the West to shape this new America. They came from a world where land was king. It was a boundless territory, a large section of it, which was once marked on the map as the Great American Desert, had been left untouched a dead possession and a problem to the government who did not know what use to make of it until the homesteaders pushed west. In the past two or three years, 200,000 homesteaders had taken up claims, filing on more than 40 million acres, making a solid coverage of 70,000 square miles. Those settlers and their families constituted a million people. Ahead of this tidal wave, in the steady stream of immigration, thousands of other settlers had moved west. Now there were several million people who must subsist on the raw lands. They, with others who had followed the homesteaders, were dependent upon their success or failure to make the western prairie produce. It had to produce. The West was the nation's reserve of natural resources. The soil was to produce cereal gold, huge fields of wheat, bread for a new people, bread, at last, for a world at war so the public lands question was of first importance. There must be new land laws and other measures enacted for these people. It was a gigantic task set for the men from out the West to perform, but already they had begun to wield an influence on the affairs of the nation. One heard of a man from Utah with the name of Smoot, who came from a class of solid builders. He was bound to be heard more of in the future, people said, and there appeared in Congress a man whose indomitable force soon became recognized as something to contend with, a man from Idaho named William E. Bora. Two other Westerners had already become statesmen of note. They had sprung from the sagebrush country. Senator Francis E. Warren and Congressman Frank W. Mondell, both of Wyoming. Senator Warren devoted a lifetime to the interests of the West, Congressman Mondell, as Speaker of the House and Chairman of the Public Lands Committee, was an influence for the homestead country, and from our own state, progressive, fearless, was Senator Peter Norbeck. The frontier is big, but news travels over it in devious ways, and the work of the Wand and of Ida Marie and me began to be known in Washington. My editorial fight for the settlers attracted the attention of these officials from the West, from several of them we received messages, commending our efforts and offering assistance in any feasible way. I also received communications from Senator Warren and Congressman Mondell commenting upon my comprehension of the homestead issue. I was asked to submit the problems of my people, and in return I sought information from them. Small things, those frontier newspapers, but the wand had achieved what Ida Marie and I had hoped of it. It had been the voice of the people a voice heard across the prairie, across the land of the burnt thigh, across the continent, to the doors of Congress itself. 
Its protests, its recommendations were weighed at last by the men best able to help the men and women on the strip, and the little outlaw printer, to her overwhelming surprise, was being recognized not only on the strip, but beyond it, as an authority on the homesteading project and a champion of the homesteaders. It was back on the lookout of the outlaw printer and the outlaw horse thieves that I got another letter from Senator Warren asking what my plans were for the future and whether I had thought of carrying my work farther on, work where, quote, the harvest was great and the laborers few, he said. Should I decide to go on into new fields, I could depend upon his support. He would recommend my newspaper as an official one, there would be many opportunities, probably government posts for which my particular knowledge would qualify me. While I was still undetermined as to what to do after my work on the proof sheet was finished, I was not a career woman, and Senator Warren's suggestions received little serious thought. Ida Marie, I thought, was serving the West in the best way for a woman. Needles and thread and bread dough have done more toward preserving nations than bullets, and the women who made homes on the prairie, working valiantly with the meager tools at their command, did more than any other group in settling the West. It was their efforts which turned tar paper shacks into livable houses, their determination to provide their children with opportunities which built schools and established communities. I was content for a while to thrust the thought of the future out of my mind, but I continued to watch with tense interest what was happening to the homestead country. A new land law had been passed which had a strong influence on the agricultural development of the West. It doubled the size of homesteads to 320 acres. This would bring farmers and families for permanent building. It would give them more pasture and plenty of land to carry on the following method. To discourage the prove-up-and-run settler, it required three years, a certain amount of fencing, and eighty acres plowed to get a deed. It created a new land splurge, a half-section. To the average homeseeker, it was like owning the whole frontier. This law was called the Mondell Act, and President Theodore Roosevelt proclaimed it, quote, a great opportunity for the poor people and a long stride in the West's progress. Roosevelt had faith in the future of a greater America. The programs which he initiated were to accomplish tremendous results in the building of the Western lands. With my bent for delving into the effect of land rulings on the settler, I made inquiry regarding certain provisions of the Mondell Act. With the information came a letter from its author expressing his belief in the advantages of the Act to the home seeker and describing what it would do in developing the territory farther west. He talked, too, about my work and my carrying it into new fields. Wyoming was bound to become a homestead mecca. And he added, quote, Your experience in South Dakota could no doubt be made of great value in aiding in the development of Wyoming. A few days after I received Congressman Mondell's letter, C. H. West arrived. Usually placid and genial, he was now wrought up. He came at once to the point of his visit. Under the enlarged homestead law, he was extending operations farther west, where he was going to settle large tracts. He wanted me to head bands of homeseekers into this new territory to help colonize it. We were entering an era of colonization, of doing things in organized groups, cooperative bodies. To the progress which these movements have made in the United States, much is owing to the West, where it was developed through necessity. Eastern men were forming profit-making corporations to colonize Western land. Real estate dealers were organizing colonies. Groups of homeseekers were organizing their own bands. Mr. West had many inquiries from such groups, and he had determined to do his own colonizing. They would want me to go to Eastern cities, he said, bring the colonists West, and help locate them satisfactorily. The locating fees, according to Mr. West, would run into money, and he proposed to give me 50% of the profits. In addition, he promised, we will advance you a fair salary and all expenses. I realized that I must face the future. The proof business on the strip was almost over. Henceforth, the paper and the post office, which had been transferred to me on Ida Marie's marriage, would eke out a bare existence. And as Ma Wagger complained, the brulee was becoming so settled, it would be having a ladies' aid before long with the women serving tea and carrying calling cards around. That would be no place for me. 
For a long time I sat gazing out of the window over the open spaces. What would this mean to the people whom I was to bring west? It was they, not I nor any other individual, whose future must be weighed. The tidal wave of western immigration would reach its crest in the next two or three years and break over Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, those states bordering the Great Divide. It was to reach its high peak in 1917 when the United States entered the World War. I remembered the shaking hands, the faces of the men and women who had lost at the Rosebud Drawing. There was still land for them, land of their own for tenant farmers, land for the homeless, the land of a million shacks. That was the slogan of the frontier. Where is this land? I asked finally. In Wyoming across the Dakota-Nebraska line, reaching into the Rawhide country, Mr. West explained. Rawhide country, lost trail, a short grass range, but rich, Lone Star had said, an honest-to-God country bigger in all creation. I turned to Mr. West and faced him squarely. Has it got water? He smiled at the sudden vehemence of the question and was ready for it. Yes, it has water, the finest in the world. Water, clear and cold, he told me, could be obtained at two to three hundred feet on almost any spot. Out on the scattered ranches, in the middle of the range, one found windmills pumping all day long. There would be plenty of water for stock and for irrigating small patches. All right, I said. I'll go. The cartoonist was going back to Milwaukee. Being here has done something for me, he said. Seeing so much effort given ungrudgingly for small results, I think. I'm going back and do something with my art. But it's odd. I don't really want to go back. One by one, the prove-up-and-run settlers had left the country, but Huey Dunn, Chris Christofferson, and others like them were learning to meet the country on its own terms and conquer it. They were there to stay. A young man appeared who was willing to run the newspaper, and I turned the post office over to Ma Wagger. Amid the weird beating of tom-toms and the hoo-hoo, ha-ha-ha of the Indians across the trail, I set up my farewell message in the wand. In gorgeous regalia of beads and quills, paint and eagle feathers, the Indians had come to send the great spirit with pale-face prince paper on to the heap-big hunting grounds. It was the time of year when paint, in all the variegated colors, was plentiful, gathered from herbs and flowers, yellow, copper, red. The affair was probably more of an excuse to celebrate than an expression of esteem. The Indians never miss an opportunity to stage a show. When they attend a county fair or other public gathering, they load up children, dogs, and worldly goods, and in a long procession they set out, arriving several days before the event and celebrating long after it is all over. They had come prepared to camp for the night at the print shop, going through special incantations for the occasion, but now they were whooping it up around the campfire. I was dragged into the dance and went careening around with old warriors and young bucks, the squaws laughing at my mistakes. As a farewell editorial, I quoted the epitaph once engraved on a tombstone. He done his damnedest. Angels could do no more. The eerie sound of the Indian dance had ceased. The flickering campfires had died down. Only two years and four months since Ida Marie and I had broken a trail to that first little homestead shack. And a chapter of my life was closed. Beyond, in the dark, slept men and women who had endured hardships and struggles and heavy labor, who had plowed up the virgin soil and set their own roots deep in it. They were here to stay. In those two years they had built a little empire that would endure, there were roads and fences, schools and thriving towns nearby where they could market their products, and during the World War, Presho became the second largest hay shipping point in the United States, with the government buying trainloads of the fine native hay from the tall grass country of the Brulee. But my work on the strip was ended. Big as the venture had seemed to me in the beginning, it was only a fraction of the country waiting to be tamed. And beyond there was Wyoming, bigger in all creation. I was going empty-handed, with no fixed program or goal. After the settlers were on the ground, there would be many obstacles which must be overcome. Down to earth again. 
Even in the initial colonizing, I would have to depend on my own initiative, on my influence with the people, and on my understanding of the homestead project. My experience on the brulee in getting settlers to work together would be invaluable. The field would be new, but the principles of cooperative effort were always the same. Upon learning that I was going on with the development work, Senator Warren wrote a letter filled with encouragement and information, and Senator Bora expressed his interest. Wyoming exemplified all the romance, the color, the drama of the old Wild West. It was noted as a land of cowboys, wild horses, and fearless men. As a commonwealth, it was invincible. It was one of the greatest sheep and cattle kingdoms in the world, where stockmen grazed their herds over government domain, lords of all they surveyed. In the past, the big cattle and sheep outfits had brooked no interference. One of the worst stockmen settler wars ever waged had been fought in Wyoming against an invasion of homesteaders, a war that became so bloody the government had to take a hand, calling out the National Guards to settle it. It was this section of the range country that I was to help fill with sodbreakers. The force of progress made it safer now, with the government and public sentiment back of the homestead movement. These stockmen settler wars, however, were not yet a thing of the past, and despite the years of Western development that followed, they continued to break out every now and then in remote range country. In self-preservation, stockmen of various sections were making it difficult for the homesteader, and it was certain that colonies of them would not be welcomed with open arms. I knew all this in a general way, of course, but I had no trepidation over the undertaking. My only qualms were on the score of health. It is a poor trailbreaker who cannot travel with strong people, and that was a drawback I couldn't overcome. All I could do was hope for the best and rely on my ability to catch up if I should have to fall behind. I took a chance on it. I rode to Ida Marie's and found her rocking and sewing and humming to herself in her new home. I'm going to help colonize Wyoming, I told her bluntly. She let her sewing fall to the floor and sat staring at me, standing bold and defiant in the middle of the floor. But my voice broke and I threw myself across her bed, crying. It was my first venture without Ida Marie. She did not say now, as she had done on other occasions, How can you help colonize a raw range country? You couldn't manage it. Life had done something to us out here. I started out from Ida Marie's. Out across the plain I turned and looked back. She was still standing in the doorway, shading her eyes so as to see me longer. We waved and waved, and I left her watching as the distance swallowed me up. At the shack I found Judge Bartine waiting for me. He observed the traces of tears on my cheeks, but made no comment on them. You know, he said, I'm glad you and your sister stuck through all this. I hesitated, on the verge of telling him how near I had come to giving up and starting a backtrack. When the cattle rustling gang I convicted burned the courthouse and my office over my head, he went on after a little pause, I made a narrow escape. I didn't have a penny in the world left with which to fight, and I knew perfectly well that I was in danger of being shot down every time I went out of the door. But I had to stay. Men could go through Hades out here for years to get a foothold and raise a herd of cattle and wake up one morning to find it gone. Something had to be done with those cattle thieves. It seems to me, I told him, the stockmen should have paid you awfully well. I got my pay, he said quietly, just as you have done. I got my pay in the doing. So, Edith, I am glad you girls did not run away. I didn't come before because I didn't want to influence you. I wanted to see you do it alone. When he had gone, I closed the door of the shack behind me. A man was riding up the trail to meet me, bringing two messages. One from the House of Representatives in Washington was signed F. W. Mondell. I am delighted, it read, to know of your faith and confidence in the country farther west, particularly the region to which you are going. I trust the settlers whom you are instrumental in bringing into the country will be successful, and I have no doubt that they will, if they are the right sort. I wish you Godspeed and success. The other letter was from Mr. West, who was awaiting me on the road to Wyoming with a group of land seekers.
On top of the ridge I stopped and gazed at the cabin, with no sign of life around it, took my last look at the land of the burnt thigh. A wilderness I had found it, a thriving community I left it. But the sun was getting low, and I had new trails to break. I gave Lakota the rein. End of chapter 17 End of Land of the Burnt Thigh by Edith Eudora Cole